Chapter 3, Looking Glass Insects. Of course, the first thing to do was make a grand survey of the country she was going to travel through. It's something very like learning geography, thought Alice as she stood on tiptoe in hopes of being able to see a little further. Principal rivers, there are none. Principal mountains, I'm on the only one, but I don't think it has a name. Principal towns, why, what are those creatures making honey down there? They can't be bees. Nobody's ever saw bees a mile off, you know, and for some time she stood silent, watching one of them that was bustling around among the flowers, poking its proboscis into them, just as if it were a regular bee, Alice thought. However, this was anything but a regular bee. In fact, it was an elephant, as Alice soon found out although the idea quite took her breath away at first. And what enormous flowers they must be, was her next idea. Something like cottages with the roofs taken off and stalks put to them. And what quantities of honey they must make. I think I'll go down and... No, no, I won't just yet, she went on, checking herself, just as she was beginning to run down the hill. And she was trying to find some excuse for turning shy so suddenly. It'll never do to go down among them without a good long branch to brush them away. And what fun it'll be when they ask me, how did I like my walk? And I shall say, oh, I like it well enough. And here came her favorite little toss of the head. Only it was so dusty and hot and the elephants did tease so. I think I'll go down the other way, she said after a pause, and perhaps I may visit the elephants later on. Besides, I do so want to get into the third square. So with this excuse, she ran down the hill and jumped over the first of the six little brooks. Tickets, please, said the guard, putting his head at the window. In a moment, everybody was holding out a ticket. They were about the same size as the people, and it seemed they quite filled the carriage. Now then, show your chick ticket, child, the guard went on, looking angrily at Alice, and a great many voices all said together, like the chorus of a song, thought Alice. Don't keep him waiting, child. Why, his time is worth a thousand pounds a minute. I'm afraid I haven't got one, Alice said in a frightened tone. There wasn't a ticket's office where I came from. And again, the voice of the chorus went on. There wasn't room for one where she came from. The land there is worth a thousand pounds an inch. Don't make excuses, said the guard. You should have bought one from the engine driver. And once more, the chorus of voices went on. The man that drives the engine, why, the smoke alone is worth a thousand pounds a puff. Alice thought to her, herself, then there's no use in speaking. The voices didn't join in this time as she hadn't spoken, but... To her great surprise, they all thought in chorus. And I hope you understand what thinking in chorus is, because I don't. Better say nothing at all. Language is worth a thousand pounds a word. I shall dream about a thousand pounds tonight. I know I shall, said Alice. All this time, the guard was looking at her. First through the telescope, then through a microscope, then through an opera glass. At last, he said, you're traveling the wrong way. And he shut up the window and he went away. So young a child, said the gentleman sitting opposite to her. He was dressed in white paper. Ought to know which way she's going, even if she doesn't know her own name. A goat that was sitting next to the gentleman in white shut his eyes and he said in a loud voice, she ought to know her own way to the ticket office, even if she doesn't know the alphabet. There was a beetle sitting next to the goat. It was a very strange carriage full of passengers altogether, and as a rule seemed to be that they should all speak in turn. Well, he went on with, she'll have to go back from here as luggage. Alice couldn't see who was sitting beyond the beetle, but a hoarse voice spoke next. Change engines, it said, and it was obliged to leave off. It sounds like a horse, Alice thought to herself. And an extremely small voice close to her head, close to her ear said, 
You might make a joke on that, something about horse and horse, you know. Then a very gentle voice in the distance said, she must be labeled lass with care, you know. And after that, the other voices went on. What a number of people there are in the carriage, thought Alice, saying, she must go by post as she's got a head on her. Well, she must be sent as a message by the telegraph. Well, she must draw the train herself the rest of the way, and so on. But the gentleman dressed in white paper leaned forward and he whispered in her ear, Never mind what they all say, my dear, but take a return ticket every time the train stops. Indeed, I shan't, Alice said rather impatiently. I don't belong to this railway journey at all. I was in a wood just now, and I wish I could get back there. You might make a joke on that, said the tiny little voice close to her ear. Something about you would if you could, you know. Don't tease so, said Alice, looking about in vain to see where the voice had come from. If you're so anxious to have a joke made, why don't you make one yourself? The little voice sighed deeply. It was very unhappy, evidently, and Alice would have said something pityingly to comfort it. If only it would sigh like other people, she thought. But this was such a wonderfully small sigh that she wouldn't have heard it at all if it hadn't come quite close to her ear. The consequence of this was that it tickled her ear very much and quite took her thoughts from the unhappiness of the poor little creature. I know you are a friend, the little voice went on, a dear friend and an old friend, and you won't hurt me, though I am an insect. What kind of an insect? Alice inquired a little anxiously. What she really wanted to know was whether it could sting or not, but she thought this wouldn't be quite a civil question to ask. What then? Uh, you don't, uh, the little voice began, and then it was drowned by a shill, shrill scream from the engine, and everybody jumped up in alarm, Alice among the rest. The horse, who had put his head out of the window, quietly drew it back in and said, it's only a brook we have to jump over. And everybody seemed satisfied with this, although Alice felt a little nervous at the idea of trains jumping at all. However, it'll take us into the fourth square, and that's some comfort, she said to herself. In another moment, she felt the carriage rise straight up into the air, and in her fright, she caught hold of the nearest thing to her hand, which happened to be the goat's beard but the beard seemed to melt away as she touched it, and she found herself sitting quietly under a tree. While the gnat, for that was the insect that she had been talking to, was balling, balancing itself on a twig just above her head and fanning her with its wings. It certainly was a very large gnat, about the size of a chicken, Alice thought. Still, she couldn't feel nervous with it after they'd been talking for so long together. Then, you don't like all insects? The gnat went on as quietly as if nothing had happened. Well, I like them when they can talk, Alice said. None of them ever talk where I come from. Well, what sort of insects do you rejoice in where you come from? The gnat inquired. Well, I don't rejoice in insects at all. Alice explained, because I'm rather afraid of them, at least the large kinds, but I can tell you the names of some of them. Hmm, of course, they answer to their names, the gnat remarked carelessly. Well, I've never known them to do it. What is the use of their having names, the gnat said, if they won't answer to them? Well, it's no use to them, said Alice, but it's useful to people who name them, I suppose. If not, why do things have names at all? I can't say, said the gnat. Further on in the wood, down there, they've got no names. However, go on with your list of insects. You're wasting time. <clears throat> well, there's the horsefly, Alice began, counting off the names on her fingers. All right, said the gnat. Halfway up that bush, you'll see a rocking horsefly, if you look. It's made entirely of wood, and it gets about by swinging itself from branch to branch. What does it live on? Alice asked with great curiosity. 
Sap and sawdust, said the gnat. Go on with the list. Alice looked up at the rocking horse fly with great interest and made up her mind that it must have just been repainted. It looked so bright and sticky. And then she went on. And there's the dragonfly. Look on that branch above your head, said the gnat, and you'll find a snap dragonfly. Its body is made of plum pudding, and its wings of holly leaves, and its head is a raisin burning in brandy. And what does it live on? Frumenty and mince pie, the gnat replied, and it makes its nest in a Christmas box. And then there's the butterfly, Alice went on, after she had taken a good look at the insect with its head on fire. And she thought to herself, I wonder if that's the reason insects are so fond of flying into candles, because they want to turn into snapdragon flies. Crawling at your feet, said the gnat, Alice drew her feet back in some alarm, you may observe a bread and butterfly. Its wings are thin slices of bread and butter, and its body is a crust, and its head is a lump of sugar. Oh, and what does it live on? Weak tea with cream in it. A new difficulty came into Alice's head. Supposing it couldn't find any, she suggested. Well, then it would die, of course. But that must happen very often, Alice remarked thoughtfully. It always happens, said the gnat. After this, Alice was silent for a minute or two, pondering. The gnat amused itself, meanwhile, by humming around and going round and round her head. At last, it settled again, and it remarked, I suppose you don't want to lose your name. No, indeed, Alice said, a little anxiously. And yet, I don't know, the gnat said, and he went on in a careless tone. Only think how convenient it would be if you could manage to go home without it. For instance, if the governess wanted to call you to your lessons and she would call out, come here, and there she would have to leave off because there wouldn't be any name for her to call. And of course, you wouldn't have to go, you know. Well, that would never do, I'm sure, said Alice. The governess would never think of excusing me lessons for that. If she couldn't remember my name, she'd call me Miss, as the servants do. Well, if she said Miss and didn't say anything else, the gnat remarked, of course you'd miss your lessons. That's a joke. <sighs> I wish you had made it. Why do you wish I had made it, Alice asked. It's a very bad joke. But the gnat only sighed deeply while two large tears came rolling down its cheeks. You shouldn't make jokes, Alice said, if it makes you so unhappy. Then came another one of those melancholy little sighs, and this time the poor gnat really did seem to have sighed itself away, for when Alice looked up, there was nothing whatever to be seen on the twig. And she was getting quite chilly with sitting so still for so long, so she got up and she walked on. Very soon, she came to an open field with a wood on the other side of it. It looked much darker than the last wood, and Alice felt a little timid about going into it. However, on second thought, she made up her mind to go on, for I certainly won't go back. And this was the only way to the eighth square. This must be the wood, she said thoughtfully to herself, where things have no names. I wonder what will become of my name when I go in. I shouldn't like to lose it at all, because they'd have to give me another one, and it would be almost certainly be an ugly one. But then the fun would be trying to find the creature that had my old name. That's just like the advertisements, you know, when people lose their dog. Answers to the name of Dash, had on a brass collar. Just fancy everyone calling, everyone calling everything Alice until one of them answered. Only they wouldn't answer at all if they were wise. She was rambling on in this way when she reached the wood. It looked very old and shady. Well... At any rate, it's a great comfort, she said as she stepped under the trees, after being so hot to get out of the, to get into the, what? She went on rather surprised, not being able to think of the word. I mean, to get under the, under the, the, this, under this, you know, she said, putting her hand on the trunk of a tree. What does it call itself, I wonder? I do believe it's got no name. 
Why, to be sure, it hasn't. She stood silent for a minute, thinking, then she suddenly began again. Then it really has happened after all, and now, who am I? I will remember, if I can. I'm determined to do it. But being determined didn't help much, and all she could come up with as a great deal of puzzling was L. I know it begins with an L. Just then, a fawn came wandering by. It looked at Alice with its large, gentle eyes, but it didn't seem at all frightened. Here then, here then, said Alice, and she held out her hand and she tried to stroke it, and it only startled back a little, and then it stood looking at her again. What do you call yourself, the fawn said at last, in such a soft, sweet voice. I wish I knew, thought poor Alice. She answered rather sadly, nothing just now. Think again, it said, that won't do. Alice thought, but nothing came of it. Please, would you tell me what you call yourself, she said timidly. I think that might help a little. I'll tell you, if you'll move a little further on, the fawn said. I can't remember here. So they walked on together through the wood, Alice with her arms clasped lovingly around the neck of the soft fawn until they came out into another open field. And here, the fawn gave a sudden bound into the air, and it shook itself free from Alice's arms. I'm a fawn, it cried out in a voice of delight, and dear me, you're a human child. A sudden look of alarm came into its beautiful brown eyes, and in another moment, it had darted away at full speed. Alice stood looking after it, almost ready to cry with vexation at having lost her dear little fellow traveler so suddenly. However, I know my name now, she said. Oh, that's a comfort. Alice, Alice, I won't forget it again. And now, which of these finger posts ought I to follow, I wonder? It was not a very difficult question to answer as there was only one road through the wood and the two finger posts both pointed along it. I'll settle it, Alice said to herself, when the road divides and they point different ways. But this did not happen. She went on and on a long way, but wherever the road divided, there were sure to be two finger posts and both of them pointing the same way. One marked to Tweedledum's house and the other to the house of Tweedledee. I do believe, said Alice at last, that they live in the same house. I wonder I never thought of that before, but I can't stay there long. I'll just have to say, how do you do, and ask them the way of the, out of the wood, and uh, if only I could get to the eighth square before it gets dark, that would be marvelous. So she wandered on, talking to herself as she went, till, on turning a sharp corner, she came upon two fat little men, so suddenly that she could not help staring back, but in another moment she recovered herself, feeling sure that they must be Tweedledum and Tweedledee.